Now let's take a look at the Bolshevik Revolution, another example of the Rothschild formula with particular attention to item number four on that list, which was the overthrow of a government that is not willing to finance its wars through the Mandrake Mechanism, which was true of Russia at that time. Now, this is another one of those myths of history. The Bolshevik Revolution is often presented as an uprising, a popular uprising of the downtrodden masses against an oppressive government, just like the French Revolution. But the facts are, ladies and gentlemen, the planning, the leadership, and the financing came almost entirely from outside Russia, mostly from financiers in Britain, Germany, and particularly the United States. This started, really started, with Jacob Schiff and the Russo-Japanese War of 1904. Much of Japan's funding for that war came from the financial house of Jacob Schiff. Actually, he was head of the U.S. investment banking firm of Kuhn Logan Company. Now, this funding allowed Japan to field a superior military effort and to win the war. Now, in appreciation for this, the Mikado awarded Schiff the second order of the treasure of Japan. Nothing particularly significant about that, except to illustrate how important the Mikado thought Schiff was in the financing of that war. Now, to the real leverage point. A ton and a half of Bolshevik revolutionary literature was sent to Japan by Schiff to be distributed among Russian prisoners of war held there. He also sent communist organizers into those prisoner camps to propagandize and recruit those prisoners into the Bolshevik cause. In effect, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of that war, there were about 50,000 officers and enlisted men who returned to Russia as seeds of revolution and played a decisive role several years later in the communist takeover of Russia. As you know, it was the turning of certain military regiments that was critical during the Bolshevik Revolution. These regiments were effectively uh, converted to the Bolshevik cause because of this propaganda activity in Japan, financed and masterminded by Jacob Schiff. Now, between 1905 and 1917, Jacob Schiff of Kuhn Logan Company also was the principal financial backer of the terrorist group in Russia called the Nihilists. Now, these people, these terrorists, changed their names historically from time to time. At that point, they were generally called Nihilists. They later became the Bolsheviks and later became the Communists. Every time there was a slight shifting or a reamalgamation of alignment of forces, they would change names, but they were basically the same group. And it was Schiff who was financing the Nihilists. Now, their mission was to assassinate heads of state. And this group, ladies and gentlemen, was organized in New York City. After Trotsky had been banished from France because of his revolutionary activities, he traveled to New York to meet with Jacob Schiff, and his travel expenses aboard the uh, Montserrat, the ship, were paid by Schiff. After his arrival, Trotsky's mass meetings in New York City and his passage back to Russia were also financed by Schiff. After his return to Europe, several million dollars were placed at Trotsky's disposal by Schiff in a branch bank in Sweden. This is all a matter of very carefully, meticulously documented history. Now, on March 23, 1917, a mass meeting was held at Carnegie Hall to celebrate the first revolution. Remember, there were two revolutions in Russia. The first one involved the overthrow of the Tsar, in which a relatively moderate government uh, came to power, the provisional government under Kerensky. And then that was later overthrown by the Bolsheviks and put firmly into the hands of communism. The second revolution was really a, more of a, of a uh, backroom, uh, what would you call it? It wasn't a revolution at all. It was just a hijacking of a government. It was a very small scale operation, involved very few people but uh, the nation was already frustrated with uh, troubles and had no police force, no, uh, you know, no military might, and it was total chaos. So relatively easy to capture a new government with a few people. But the first revolution overthrew the Tsar, 
And at the end of that, there was a big celebration in New York City, of course. And Jacob Schiff sent a telegram to be read to the audience at that meeting at Carnegie Hall. In that telegram, he expressed his regrets at not being able to attend. And then he said that he described the revolution as, quote, what we had hoped and striven for these long years, end quote. It is also a historical fact that Schiff was a primary factor in financing the second revolution in Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution, which overthrew the Kerensky Provisional Government in October of 1917. Now, in the February 3rd, 1949 issue of the New York Journal America, Jacob Schiff's grandson, John Schiff, was quoted to the effect that his grandfather had given about $20 million for the triumph of communism in Russia. Now, just think of what $20 million was worth in 1917, 1916, 1914. Now, I want to point out, ladies and gentlemen, quickly here, that Schiff was not alone. There were other sources of funding within the cabal. Leon Trotsky, in his book, My Life, tells of a British financier who gave him about 21 million rubles. This was undoubtedly Lord Alfred Milner. Now, we don't have time to talk about Milner, but Milner was one of the organizers and founders of the roundtable groups which uh, evolved into the Council on Foreign Relations here in the United States. And if you don't know who Lord Milner was, you better find out. He was one of these dark, shadowy figures who wielded a tremendous power well beyond his station because he controlled both money and politicians. Anyway, there was no doubt that the source of this funding was Lord Alfred Milner. Now, other sources of funding for the overthrow of the Tsar and the establishment of Bolshevism were Olaf Ashberg of the Nye Bank in Stockholm, the Rhine-Westphalian Syndicate, and a wealthy banker named Jivotovsky, whose daughter later married Trotsky. In Germany, the chief source of funding was an international banker by the name of Max Warburg, whose brother Felix was married to the daughter of Jacob Schiff. And his other brother, Paul Warburg, later was to become the chief architect of the Federal Reserve System here in the United States. Now, Russia was teeming with British and American agents at that time. There was no secret about this. There were many foreign reporters and observers who were sending back communiques, many of which wound up in the American press, some of which were private communiques. Many observers were telling how Russia was swarming with Americans and, and Englishmen. And these people had suitcases full of money and they were handing out money to revolutionaries primarily those in the military barracks, trying to get to incite them to revolution. Uh, one report said, for example, that British uh, agents were seen handing out 25 ruble notes to the men at the Pavlovsky Regiment just a few hours before it mutinied against its officers and sided with the revolution. Now, on the American side of this little operation, this was all under the umbrella of what was called the American Red Cross Mission. Now, I'm not casting an aspersion on the Red Cross, because you understand that the Red Cross is made up of many different missions in different countries and so forth. And it turned out that the American Red Cross Mission to Russia was a very special breed of cat. It had practically nothing at all to do with the Red Cross. It was uh, made up of men who were disguised as Red Cross officials on a humanitarian mission, but the majority were composed of financiers, lawyers, accountants, and their staffs, and assistants who were representatives of New York's banks and investment houses. The entire expense of the American Red Cross mission to Russia was paid for by one man, and his name was William Thompson. Now, Thompson was ideal for a Red Cross mission. He was a close associate of J.P. Morgan, and he was the director of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Now, doesn't that qualify him to run a Red Cross mission? So there he was. 
He was in charge and he paid for it. I doubt if it all came out of his personal pocket, although much of it probably did. He expected to gain handsomely from his participation, but I think that there were others involved. Now, the assistant to William Thompson at that time, as head of the Red Cross mission, was a fellow by the name of Cornelius Kelleher. Kelleher, on reflecting on this episode at that time, uh, wrote a book, and in this book he was describing one of the few dupes in the Red Cross mission who didn't understand what was going on. And he said, quote, Poor Mr. Billings believed he was in charge of a scientific mission for the relief of Russia. He was, in reality, nothing but a mask. The Red Cross complexion of the mission was nothing but a mask, end quote. Well, what was the purpose of the mission then? It was clear. It was to channel funds into the revolution with local control on the scene by the men who were giving the funds who could direct the revolution. As simple as that. Thompson himself gave over two million rubles to the Kerensky government or, and to the Kerensky uh, regime for propaganda purposes inside Russia. He gave one million dollars to the Bolsheviks for the spreading of revolutionary propaganda even outside of Russia, particularly in Germany and Austria, and this led to the abortive German Spartacus revolt of 1918. So it wasn't just Russia they were interested in. They want Bolshevik revolutions everywhere. And they tried it in Germany. It failed. And all of this was reported widely in the American press at that time. Now, when Thompson returned to the United States, he put a man in charge of the mission by the name of Raymond Robbins. Now, Robbins was the personal protege of Colonel Edward Mandel House. Colonel Edward Mandel House was in the United States, the counterpart of Lord Alfred Milner in Britain, one of those shadowy behind-the-scenes figures who wields great power far beyond his apparent position. Colonel House, for those of you who are not familiar with him, was uh, he came from banking circles, and he was the uh, very private and personal advisor to presidents such as Woodrow Wilson and FDR. And he also was one of the engineers of the Federal Reserve System, which we'll be talking about shortly. In any event, uh, Raymond Robbins was the protege of Colonel Edward Mandel House. Now, Robbins was a central character in a book, which I discovered quite by accident one day in a used bookstore. It was called British Agent by Bruce Lockhart. Lockhart was Milner's man in Russia. This gets kind of involved, but what we're dealing here with is two shadowy figures. In the United States, the shadowy figure is Colonel House, and his protege is Raymond Robbins in Russia. In England, the shadowy figure is Lord Alfred Milner, and his protege is Bruce Lockhart. Now, they're over there doing official work on behalf of the powers that be, but they're doing it under disguises, as humanitarians or reporters or something like that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what kind of power do you suppose these men represented? To ask the question is to answer it. But what did these men want out of the Bolshevik Revolution? What does the cabal always want? If my thesis about the master plan is correct, it wanted three things. The overthrow of the Russian imperialist government, which would not borrow from a central bank, and the establishment of one that would. Two, the creation of a hostile, aggressive regime which would threaten Europe, and later the world, with war. Three, above all, it wanted the vast profits that could be extracted from the human and natural resources of Russia. I personally believe it obtained all of these objectives, and I think it continues to enjoy those objectives today, although some of them may be a little more hidden from view. We'd love to talk about that, but we don't have time, we have to move on.